Hello and welcome back. In the last video, we introduced the untyped lambda terms consisting of variables, applications, and abstractions. In this second video of chapter one, we want to discuss computation in the lambda calculus, which will be done via better reduction and analyze what a result of a lambda term might be. Okay, so what is computation? Computation are the steps we need to take in order to get from applying a function to an input to substituting and simplifying it. Applying a term to an input was denoted by an abstraction, lambda x dot m applied to a term n, and substitution was written as m squared brackets x defined as n. We need a notion to get from here to here. This notion will be called better reduction, one step better reduction to be precise. We denote one step better reduction by a left to right arrow with a better as a subscript. The definition contains only two rules. The basis rule enables the actual reduction, from application to substitution. If we apply a term, depending on x, to an input n, we resolve this by substituting every occurrence of the x in the function body m by n. The second rule, called the compatibility rule, assures that the reduction also holds if a subterm is reduced. Let me quickly illustrate this part. We have a long term. Somewhere in between, we have the lambda x dot m applied to n construct and something before and after. This term, or rather subterm, which we want to reduce, is called a reducible expression, or redx for short. Now, if we reduce this redx, also called contracting it, the rest of the term doesn't change. So everything before and after stays just as it is, and we get the corresponding so called contractum instead of the redx. m squared brackets x defined as n. So this compatibility rule just tells us if we can reduce a part of an application or an abstraction, then we can also reduce the whole term by inserting the contractum. For example, if m is one step reducible to n, then m applied to l is one step reducible to n applied to l, and lambda x dot m is one step reducible to lambda x dot n. It's called one step reduction because exactly one red x is replaced by its contractum at a time. There is also a many step reduction with which we can abbreviate a reduction sequence by doing many steps at once. But before we get to that definition, let's look at a few examples. As always, feel free to pause the video and try these computations by yourself first. In the lambda term lambda x dot x applied to xy applied to n, we only have one red x. It's the x red x with n as an input. So the reduction is quite straightforward. It reduces to the function body x applied to xy in brackets with x substituted by n. We can now execute the substitution and get n applied to n y. We have to be careful about the notions now. Whenever we execute a better reduction, we need to use the arrow and the equivalent sign for the substitution. The second example has two red x's which could be reduced, and we need to decide which one to do first. Either we put in the z for y by reducing the y red x, or we reduce the x red x with v as its input. We're going to do both of them and compare the results. If we reduce the y red x first, we get the following. Lambda x dot x applied to y, where we substitute y by z. And all of that still applied to v. Here, some additional parentheses might be useful to emphasize that the substitution is happening inside the abstraction. So we have the x applied to y with y substituted by z and abstract x from this term. By executing the substitution, we get lambda x dot xz applied to v. If we reduce the x radix first, we get lambda y dot xy applied to z with x substituted by v. And after substituting, we get lambda y dot vy applied to z. Both terms contain another red x which we can reduce. They both reduce to the same term vz. This raises a few questions. Is it always the case that we reach the same term no matter what the order? Or does it matter in what order we reduce something? And does a reduction always end somewhere? We're going to answer the first question later in the video. The last question about never-ending reductions will be answered with the third and last example. Here only one reduction is possible, and it's one that seems a bit more challenging. We have x as the input variable which we should apply to itself. The input term is the same term as the red x term. Lambda x dot x applied to x. If we execute better reduction, we get the following substitution. x applied to x, 
where we substitute x by lambda x dot x x. And executing the substitution gives us the input term applied to itself. This is the same term that we originally started with. So we can see that the reduction didn't change the term. And this term obviously still contains a red x. And we would need to reduce this again. But that would just result in the term again and again and again. This phenomenon is due to the fact that this last term, let's call it big omega, uses self-reference or self-application. So computing it doesn't have an end. For a program, this would mean that it doesn't terminate. For a function, that there's no result. And this is something that we would definitely like to avoid. Before we get even deeper into the consequences of such behavior, we still have to define the many-step reduction that we mentioned earlier. m was one step better reducible to a term if there was a red x in m which we can contract. Similarly, m is supposed to be many-step better reducible to n if there's a chain of one-step better reductions starting from m to m1 to m2, and so on, all the way to mn. We denote this by adding a star to the one-step reduction arrow similar to the notion in regular expressions. An interesting fact is that the number of one-step better reduction in this many-step reduction from m to n can be zero. That means that m is many-step better reducible to itself, even though it's not one-step better reducible to itself. And of course, if m is already one-step reducible to n, it's also many-step reducible to n. We say that many-step better reduction extends one-step better reduction. Therefore, all of our examples from before are examples for this reduction. We can even shorten the reduction sequence in the second example by writing down that the term is many step better reducible to vz instead of writing two one step reductions. So now we're able to reduce and substitute in terms. Unfortunately, we're still not quite capable of actually computing anything. What we have so far is the ability to say f of 5, which was equivalent to 5 squared plus 1, can be reduced to 25 plus 1, which can obviously further be reduced to 26 but we have no symmetric equality sign, and therefore we can't add anything which isn't needed for computing, and we can't undo any computations. To see why this is preferable, take a look at a squared plus 2ab plus b squared divided by a plus b. What does this term stand for? If we undo the binomial extension, we can transform our term into a plus b squared divided by a plus b, which equates to a plus b. So we needed to undo the computation of the binomial formula to be able to simplify the term. This two-way computation is an extension of the better reduction and is called better equivalence or better conversion. A lambda term m is better convertible to a lambda term n if there's again a chain of reductions starting in m and ending in n. But this time the reductions can crisscross to the left or the right, for example like so. Starting with a lambda term m, m is one step reducible to a lambda term m1 and next, going the other way, a term m2, which is better reducible to m1. So here the better reduction doesn't go left to right as in many step reduction, but right to left. Additionally, m2 is also reducible to another term m3, which is the term n that we wanted to reach. So every reduction chain is also a conversion chain, but not the other way around. For example, lambda y dot yv applied to z is better convertible to lambda x dot zx applied to v, although it's not better reducible. The conversion holds as they are both better reducible to zv. So we get the following chain. First, the lambda y dot yv term, which is reducible to zv by substituting the y with the z. And then the lambda x dot zx term, which is reducible to zv by substituting the x with the v. The second example looks quite similar. Lambda x dot x applied to xy, with the input n is better reducible to n applied to ny, as we proved a few minutes ago, and therefore it's better convertible. But we can also construct a convertible term with the input y like so. We need a bound variable like z, then the term n applied to ny, but we put the z instead of the y, so n applied to nz, and then applied all to y. Reducing this would yield our original term. Clearly, better convertibility extends better reduction. Whenever a term is better reducible to another, they are also better convertible. It's also easy to prove that better conversion is an equivalence relation. So far, we've seen a few operators that make comparing lambda terms possible. We have the equivalent sign, 
which was introduced for syntactical equivalence, and was then extended to the execution of substitution, and lastly also denotes alpha convertible terms. Then we've got the one and many step better reduction, denoted by the arrow with and without a star respectively. And finally, the better conversion denoted by the equality sign with a better below it. Since the better conversion is an equivalence relation, there should be a representative for equivalence classes. Let's quickly remind ourselves what a representative could be. A very simple equivalence relation is whether a number is even or not. The equivalence classes are then the even and odd numbers, and fitting representatives for each class are 1 and 2 respectively. So a representative should at first glance show the key property of the equivalence class. For better conversion, we want to look at a term which can't be reduced any further. In an equivalence class, all terms are better convertible to one another. So this term, that can't be reduced any further, can be found given any member of the equivalence class just by reducing everything. So this seems like a pretty good choice. If there is such a term, we're going to call it the better normal form. As we've seen, there are lambda terms that don't have one. The term big omega, for example. A lambda term m is in better normal form if it can't be better reduced any further. These are exactly the terms that don't contain any red x. A lambda term has a better normal form if there's a term n in better normal form such that the two are better convertible. So for example, our term lambda x, lambda y dot xy applied to z and v has the better normal form zv. And then the term omega, which was lambda x dot xx applied to lambda x dot xx doesn't have a better normal form since it can only be reduced to itself and it contains a red x. Interestingly, this doesn't mean that every term that contains omega doesn't have a better normal form. Maybe pause the video for a second and think about what such a term could look like. Consider the following term, lambda v dot u applied to omega. We have two red x's, the x red x in omega and another in lambda v dot u. As we know, omega only reduces to itself. So if we keep reducing the red x of this term, we will always get lambda v dot u applied to omega. And we're not going to get anywhere. But if we decide to reduce lambda v dot u, we get u and substitute v by omega. And since there's no v in the term, it reduces to just u, which is a better normal form. So this term, although it contains omega, indeed has a better normal form. In conclusion, there are terms that have a better normal form and some that don't. It's even possible to get into an infinite chain of reductions even though the term actually has a normal form. And this property of a lambda term, so whether it can run into an infinite chain of reductions or not, is actually very important for the analysis of such a system. So we're going to give it a name. Whenever a term can be reduced to a better normal form, we're going to call the term weakly normalizing. If every reduction chain eventually reaches that better normal form, we call the term strongly normalizing. Of course, every strongly normalizing term is also weakly normalizing. So for example, lambda v, lambda u dot u applied to omega is weakly normalizing, but not strongly normalizing because we can create an infinite reduction chain where we always reduce the omega red x. The term omega is not normalizing at all. All other examples that we've seen so far, along with almost every other term, are strongly normalizing. We can define this normalization even for whole systems. A system of mathematical functions has the strong normalization property if every term is strongly normalizing. This is also called just normalizing or terminating. Similarly, a system is called weakly normalizing, well, if every term has a normal form and is thus weakly normalizing. A system with the normalization property can be viewed as a programming language in which every program terminates. In the next video, we're going to discuss the power of the untyped lambda calculus, so what functions can be defined with it. We're going to see that the system is actually Turing complete and can define every Turing computable function. This only works because the untyped lambda calculus is not normalizing. And actually, an interesting note is that every programming language satisfying the normalization property can't be Turing complete. We're going to conclude today's video with a very important theorem about better reduction, which states that the order in which we reduce a term actually doesn't matter for the outcome. So basically, we can't get lost in reduction chains. Most commonly, this theorem is called the Church-Rosser theorem, named after Alonzo Church and Barclay Rosser who proved it in 1936. Since the proof is much more involved than one would expect, we're not going to prove it here. You can read up on it using the references provided in the literature section, or you can take my word for it. A very nice proof that we can recommend can be found in Lambda Calculi with types by H.P. Barendrecht. The theorem is as follows. Whenever we can reduce a term m to n1 and n2, 
there is a common lambda term N3 to which they both reduce. This property can be illustrated as follows. We have the term M at the top, many step better reducible to N1 on the left, and many step better reducible to N2 on the right. The theorem now says that they are both many step reducible to a common N3. We've already seen an example of this. Remember the term lambda x dot lambda y dot xy applied to z applied to v. We reduced this in two ways. One way was reducing the x radix, which led to lambda y dot vy applied to z. The other reducing the y radix, which led to lambda x dot xz applied to v. We then observed that they both reduce to vz. OK, I think that's quite enough for this video. We defined better reduction and better conversion, which are both needed to perform computation and simplification on lambda terms. After that, we introduced the better normal form, which is basically the result of a term, and observed that there are some terms in the lambda calculus with and without normal forms. There's even some terms which we can reduce infinitely without reaching any normal form, even though they have a better normal form. In the next video, we're going to see a lot more practical examples. We're going to construct natural numbers and see how to define simple functions like addition, subtraction, and even the factorial function. Thank you very much for watching, and see you in the next video.